I saw a Bruce Lee movie. I asked my dad, oh, Bruce is your cousin or your brother? Because he's he Chinese and he's me, like, like us. Uh, he should, should be uh, our uh, relative. No, that. there's a lot of Lees. Actually, Lee is the most popular uh, last name in the world. 200 million Lees. One of them. Okay. So, and, uh, but uh, I, I was, uh, you know, I feel very weird, uh, totally outplaced for my my local society. But when I play soccer, well, I sorry, when I play football, <laughs> I been two months in the US. Uh, they call it football soccer. I don't know why. You know, when I play uh, football, uh, like all the sport team, you feel yourself integrated. Uh, you feel that uh, the, the color of your skin is not important. Uh, you belong to uh, something. This is why that my childhood dream was not to become an entrepreneur or an investor. My childhood dream was to become a professional football player and play, play for FC Barcelona. That was my childhood dream. But unfortunately for me, uh, I was not able to uh, even play for my school team. <laughs> my, school team. Yeah. Uh, my genes are not okay for football, and, for, and uh, but my uh, but I was a geek. Well, I'm still a geek. I love computers. I love robots. That mass in your zip is a uh, is uh, that's me when I was little uh, a kid. I started to go at 10, and, at, uh, and then I, I've been always with computers, with my software, and then, well, probably uh, football is not for me, but uh, I know how to code, I go to engineering school, and then uh, uh, I apply to the engineering school. Uh, that's me, in my, oof, that's a very old picture, it's like 30 years. 30 years ago, something like that. So I applied to the, I was admitted to the best engineering school in, Bar in, in my country. And that, uh, so it was, my, my parents were very proud, oh, because my, my parents, they went to Spain to get uh, their PhD. My grandfather, he was a professor at the University of Taipei. And I was admitted to the best engineering school. And it was. Uh, a big thing for my family, especially for an Asian family. But in two months, I decided to quit. <laughs> I start my company. Do, um, and that this is not for me. This is very boring. I spend all my time learning maths. I want to build my software. I want to sell it around the world. This is not for me. That this is why I start my first company at the age of 20, 21. This picture is. Uh, the first picture taken by a digital camera. Yes, it was 16K uh, bytes, more or less. It's a wise, very pixel. And that was my first startup. During three years, I was living in the garage of my, uh, of my startup. So some people work in their garage. I was living in my garage. <laughs> I'm working. Uh, with three folks, uh, we have no money. No network, no knowledge, and nothing to lose. And after only it took me six days, fourteen hours per day, and in a total of three thousand eight hundred ninety-seven days. Ten years, more or less ten years. I was cruising the desert during 10 years, uh, every, suffering every month for paying the salary. Uh, not my salary, of course, the salary of the people that was teaming with me. And hearing a lot of noise around me because my parents, they get annoyed when I told them that I was quitting the engineering school and I was starting my business because all their friends, uh, uh, they are going, uh, they have children that they grow up and go to the best universities 
work for the most important banks in Spain or become um, um, employees in a huge corporation and I was traveling in a garage and of course my parents, they want the best for me, like all the parents, and uh, they were and they, were, they were witness you know, to see how I was traveling. But after 10 years, I met Shai, Shai changed my life. <laughs> I, went, I attended to the Ignite program at uh, Cambridge, probably one of the best entrepreneurial programs. And then, now it's, now it's here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is what happened. You know, I started in 1995. I met Shai here. And since I think our turnover was around two million for them, and this year it's going to be something like 120 in, in 10 years. So that I think there's uh, one after and one before of meeting Shai. What I learned from Shai is to think global. Uh, well, it's probably it's obvious for, for somebody, somebody from UK, but from somebody from a small town in Spain, it's not obvious. Uh, for me, my world was my town or my province. When I started the business, I used to tell my colleagues, we should be the best tech company in our city. Now, we were the only one, so. <laughs> no, that was my thought. So I attended to the program of Shai, I learned a lot, I was inspired by a lot of amazing entrepreneurs. And then we will start to build our company global. And then we've been building companies. I, I've been investing in some some other. And uh, well, this is this news from come from the last year. The last year we did 75 million. This year we're doing 120. In revenues, profitable, no debt, no credit. Uh, two years ago I decided to. Um, Change my role, and now I am. Uh, I, I'm taking a more. Uh, I'm uh, sitting at the, uh, in, the, in the board of uh, my company, and the second largest shareholder. But now I'm investing. Uh, after 20 years becoming an entrepreneur, I think it's time to change a little bit and become an um, uh, investor. Uh, we raised our fund uh, two years ago. Is a uh, 300 million uh, dollars fund, and we are investing in Silicon Valley, China, and some parts of Europe and UK. Uh, because UK is Europe, or it's not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who knows? Well, uh, I didn't succeed. Well, it looks good, but <laughs> I played for the, with the veterans of FC Barcelona one month for 30 minutes. Uh, they are people like in their 70s. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the closest. I, I, I didn't succeed to become a professional soccer player, but I'm honored to be the first board member who worked in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, Luis Enrique, our former coach, uh, and that's our last trophy. And that's it. <laughs> when, when you listen on the radio to actors and, and, and uh, professional politicians, public speakers, um, they make the point very clearly that uh, it's absolutely essential to have those butterflies in your tummy um, and that you never get rid of them. So being somewhere towards the abject terror side is quite important. Um, the second thing is, I did my MBA here um, about 25 years ago now. And um, I was struck, and I still remember the feeling as I was part of the cohort of some really amazingly bright um, people with a, with a fine wit and a fine brain. And whenever I come back here, I, that still just, just haunts me slightly, so there's a little terror from that. Um, particularly when I have exactly the same, my slightly later cohort facing me here. Um, and thirdly, I think because I am not a guru. I was lucky. Um, what I can bring you, therefore, this afternoon is um, some experience and some observations. In the military, um, I was taught with Z was to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them it, and then tell them what you just told them. 
Um, and it's great advice if we have time, um, but I'm only going to make my points once, you'll be relieved to know, um, so that there's no introduction and there's no summary slide either. But do please ask me questions at the end. Okay. Firstly, um, I should say with sincere regret at Venture Day that I am no longer an entrepreneur. Um, take that slide down over the back there. <laughs> I sold all my shares in Ringo um, almost exactly five years ago, five years, two weeks ago. Um, and since that time, I've had no participative equity interest in any companies um, at all. I've been nothing but an employee um, and a wage slave. Uh, not holding equity does make a huge difference. It, it does. It. And uh, I honestly can't recommend it. Watch this space. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know the story, I started a company called Cobalt Telephone Technologies, um, a deliberately, assertively big name for a terrifying or a particularly tiny, embarrassingly small enterprise back in 1997, and that's me over on the right. Um, Hewlett Packard, of course, famously started in a garage. I couldn't afford a garage. Um, so I hired a porter cabin on a fortnightly basis, um, and uh, yeah, it went from there. Um, I think the story, and it's a lengthy one, is best analysed really in three phases, three propositional phases, and these are they. Um, the first one lasted for two years. The reason I started my business was because I was entranced by the idea of a technology I'd come across called interactive voice response. And that was perhaps the um, smartphone app of its day. And it meant that computers, and these were 386 and 486 back then, could be stuffed full of some dialogic cards and, and a bit of software, uh, costing you probably about £4,000 at the time. And it could do the work of four call centre agents, who back in those days probably cost £600 a month. And as you can see, you know, the payback is a matter of six weeks or so. Um, now, as I say, it really caught my attention, um, but it was a fact. You know, this is just a fact. It <coughs> wasn't a tightly aimed customer or, or packaged niche customer proposition. And that's where I went horribly wrong. That was a rookie error. And it actually almost cost me everything because at the end of that first phase, all I did was lose money because there was these massive customers I could potentially support but none of them quite got it, and I certainly didn't. I was lucky. My piece of luck was I got a parking ticket. Um, and turned it over, and on the back it said, pay by cash at the town hall, or send them a check. And I realized that the company, or capability that I had, could be tightly focused in to taking penalty charge notice payments for local authorities on a white label basis. That was our first product, and it continues today. Gross mice cash cow by now, I hardly need to say. The gross margin is in the nine high 90s uh, percent, I should tell you that. Um, and it's still, <laughs> it's still bringing in a cool million pounds worth of revenue every year. So um, then I did one of the very few things I remember from Crank Google, the model was I think there was something where basically you know, the old two by two matrix, mm -hmm. and you could either go as a company, if you were in the bottom box, there was market, same market up one side, and there was uh, Oh, different market, different product, the two axes. And the thing not to do was go into the Wally box, as I remember it being called, um, which was really going, taking your second product in a, from a set, uh, different product into a different market. And I, well, I can remember that. So I didn't. I went, stayed in the same market of parking. I just came up with a different product, which was Ringo. And I should imagine, if you're representative, and I think you probably are, that probably half this room are members of Ringo. Um, uh, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, well, we're in there, that speaks for itself, really. Um, kicked off in 2005. We now have about 10.8 million registered repeat users. I'll make that point. Um, I think we've taken well, well over a billion transactions. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, I sold it in 2012. Uh, actually, there was somebody else involved. At which point it was self liquidating. So, I think I shouldn't have sold it, really. Um, and what I mean by that is throwing enough cash to fund its own growth, and so we had uh, entirely bootstrapped it. Uh, at the time of the sale, all of the equity was 
in the hands of me and actually my business partner at the time, Ms. Joanna Miller, who happens to be in the audience today. Hello, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd hate that. Right. <laughs> um, let me come to the crux. Uh, great. If you'll excuse the pun, uh, it hasn't been a case of Harry pottering about. Um, there is no magic wand to Graham. Um, it's exactly as it says there, it does take years, years and years of nights and weekends. There was a chap, Rick Dobbins, who made that point when I was here 25 years ago. Um, let me just throw four sort of points, bullet points up there that I think are important. Um, the first one is really saying there's a lot to be said for a growth market because if all you're doing is growing with the rest of the uh, market, then you're growing quite a lot because what, what that means, the rising tide means it's expanding and you will expand with it. And we had that great opportunity because the parking market was just deregulating and so we were, we were fortunate on that point. Niche niches. What's a niche niche? Um, well, an obvious niche might be um, doing what Facebook's doing. That's a niche, you know, providing a social media platform. Um, but it's an obvious one. Everybody's trying to get into that. Um, I know um, John Thorne is here today, uh, another very well-known uh, alumni. Uh, thank you, John. And um, he's got a niche niche. Uh, cool milk for schools. And uh, the secret to his business, sorry, John, I didn't say I'd say this, <coughs> is that he's got no competitors because nobody else has worked out it's a cracky place to be. And long may that stay, I hope I haven't given you said it yourself, so I'm saving up the only way for secret. So don't go for the obvious ones, try and find something interesting, because that's so much easier to grow. Pull that drawbridge up behind you. Now we didn't really, that was a bit of luck because the drawbridge naturally comes up, it becomes more and more difficult, the barriers to entry I'm talking about here. But make sure that you differentiate, you add depth and, and you know, you, you rattle those things. In our case, with municipalities and local authorities we talk about compliance gdpr is a fantastic one because you know we, we're big enough now that we have to do that anyway and the little tiddlers who are trying to get into a market you know, it's, it's 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 too big for them uh, so that's a good one and then brand uh, i have to say that ringo was all down to me and, and and the design of it and that has served us massively well it was a brand i came up with a design agency sat down with the chap matt barrett uh, and we came up with a brand which we simply haven't changed and it's managed from the single first car park that I, first car park sign I put up in Bristol, uh, taking an aluminium ladder on an Easter Monday, 2015, uh, no, 2005, um, and, and put it up myself and it's the same logo that we've got and that's been, that's been very helpful. The meat of my talk is perhaps these two slides and I present them to you. Um, it's all about the people. So you've got to have that culture. Um, because that culture will be uh, grow itself. Um, what I mean, outliers, they're those weird products that seem like a really good idea when you started off. But as your core product grows and, and has to become bigger and more uh, all encompassing, you need to trim back those other ones. And, and if you don't, then your growth will become sprawling. So make sure that you're constantly trimming back to core business, even though you think you've got the capability to do it. People do tire, and also technology moves on. So fresh blood is terribly helpful, particularly in things like process. People will have had experience in bigger companies. You know, trouble with, you've got some cracking people in your organization, been there a long time, but they've got used to the way that things happen within your firm. And get, bring people in who've had experience from larger companies. There's a downside to that, which I'll come to in the next slide, but keep those new skills coming in. Just look at the organisational structure. A good example is up to about 80 people, you don't really need an HR department. Get beyond 80, and you should, because an HR manager starts to add value with the recruiting and you know, the issues that you have. You know, I was in a tribunal you know, three days this week. Issues happen, and you can get diverted from your main you know, focus. That's just one example, there's plenty of them. Do not keep scaling the same organisation. Constantly look. Look at, go and look at other organisations your size and see that they have a, <coughs> uh, not just a finance department, a finance team, they have, they have a team that, that, that does uh, analysis, um, that, that just, just looks at the internal process and comes up with the internal figures, that kind of stuff. There's, uh, there's plenty of examples, but do not scale your existing organisation. Same is true with software. 
Uh, don't just use the same old stuff. There's plenty of you know, ticketing, help desk systems, those kind of things, uh, ways in which you might manage your software development. Constantly change those. There are amazing things. I spent last week in the States doing exactly, I actually do what I preach here. I went to go and see our sister organization based in Atlanta, which is in phone parking. I sat down with the chief exec and said, do you mind if I just walk over your business and see how you do it? And they had um, a particular piece of um, software called Localytics, um, which, which somehow, using little keys in the apps, because we're all using apps now, just tells you it's so rich with data, telling you what people are doing and how they're using the app. He's increased his usage by 10% just by finding out what people do and optimizing his app to make them do more of it. <coughs> Keep yourself the thinking room, and there are plenty of CEO forums. I'm sure I could plug the BGP at this one, but um, there's a supper club and there are various other ways where you can talk to people who are growing companies. There's lots of experience out there. And I come back to this equity point. Um, dish some out because it's attractive to keep it all for yourself, but it does, as you get bigger, help that next layer of management and buy them in. Um, I was sitting in the car park rehearsing this slide, and I thought of another wing, which I was stunned it hasn't made it to the slide, but I do believe it actually. So if you really don't know how to grow your business, sell some shares to private equity because if they'll buy it and it's any good, they'll show you how to grow it there's any growth potential there. <laughs> Do it carefully, mind, but it's, uh, it's worth the thought. <clears throat> so the other big one is what shouldn't you do? Um, as I say, I have worked <coughs> five years as an employee and I am no longer the chief executive or necessarily the, the big driving force. So I watch, despite all I can try and do to stop people bubbling up a very good business. And so some of this comes very much from the heart. Don't muck about with the product. Um, I'm very much reminded whenever I see a piano knocking around that, do you know, it's been there for the user interface hasn't changed for 250 years. Beethoven could rise from the grave, Mozart could, and he could play a modern day piano forte because it hasn't changed. Equally, the QWERTY keyboard hasn't changed for about 80 years. And but nonetheless, Windows, every time, every 18 months, has to muck up a word, the way that word processors work. Word processing is a core, simple stuff. Why change it? What was wrong with drop-down menus? I mean, <laughs> help me here. And, and so do think about that. Be very careful. Uh, don't let your techies dictate the products. And do think very carefully about changing. I think Apple is very good in this regard. Similarly with the brand, um, my German masters uh, will, and I... <coughs> You won't go there. Well, you hear this first. Uh, Ringo is not going to be around for very much longer. Uh, it's going to be called Park now. Um, okay, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> I, don't allow your employees to burn out. Um, if you have the culture, which I am suggesting you do, and I'm sure you're all capable of engendering that culture, some of the alpha people, some of the very best people, um, will, will just take it into their hearts and they will burn themselves out and damage themselves. So don't let that happen. Um, just watch for it, be aware of it, and try not to let it happen. If you do, support them through it. Uh, been there, done that. Again, um, corporate politics. What I did say in the last slide was go outside and get people who have experience of bigger companies. Um, and invariably, so somebody perhaps from IBM um, who's got an experience of how to really optimize a gigantic, you know, sort of data warehouse for you, something like that. But be careful that they don't come with those downsides from large business. And these are the ones, um, because you don't need this. You don't need these in any company. And you certainly don't want them injected or infected with people quarantine. Make sure that the good people that you bring out, bring in um, from rightly, from big companies, do not do this. Um, believing strategy consultants, um, again, um, strategy consultants are really good, but on the other hand, they have a certain way of doing things, and um, they can be led, and uh, if I look at our own organization, I cannot say that the expensive strategy consultants that have come into our organization have been that helpful. What they've done is they've, they've laid out a you know, cornucopia of opportunities and, you know, so 
our shareholders looked at it and wow, let's go forward with all of these at the same time. No, be careful. Be very careful on that and try and control that in the way that they do that. Um, budgets, um, I'm sorry for the other uh, alliterative <laughs> work. Um, in my organisation currently, we talk quite a lot about Budget 54, and there's not, I believe, Budget 57, and Joanna, you'll remember this, I think it's Budget 63 or something like that. So there are these, these, you know, these are versions, 54, 57, and yeah. 63, genuinely, I don't care. And, you know, where are you with this? Um, the other thing is, people believe them. They believe that these budgets are the right way to do stuff. And therefore, if something changes massively, then the budget does not allow for it. Um, <clears throat> you can be, again, you have got to be careful because I've always come from the uh, from the school that you know, being having a positive variance bar budget is a good thing. Um, there's a line of thought which I've now encountered which uh, that a positive variance is a bad thing because variance is a bad thing. Okay, okay. yes, <laughs> true. No, true again. But I think this point is really key if you're going for growth. Just be careful if you ever feel comfortable, because if you are comfortable, that's telling you it's time to change. Yeah. Um, three more points, I think. <coughs> you need to be looking ahead, um, and again, this is perhaps a variation on the idea of scaling. Um, in my particular industry, phone parking, um, at the moment, the major customer interface is the smartphone, the app, and that's because people are driving their own cars. Um, it's pretty clear in this world of autonomous self-driving cars, which is coming, and it's coming a little bit faster, it's coming slower than you might think, but then it's one of those, um, <laughs> is that cars are going to be parking themselves. Mm. And so therefore, the way in which we should begin to start organising our uh, company has to take account of that. And there are short examples in your own businesses, do look ahead and just maybe do some scenario planning is a way of doing it. And just think, which way could my industry go? And then, and then take no more than three scenarios and just have a little think about, think about that, plan accordingly as I make the point. Um, the picture here is trying to show, I think it's quite a good quote, is that uh, if you arrive at the party too early, there's no guests to talk to. And if you arrive too late, you're picking up the trash. And I think that's, I think that's a good point. So there is a... If you over plan and you get there too early, you have a whole raft of what I would call science projects where you set R&D running and they're all, they're all following a future and they're delivering stuff that the customer is not yet ready for. And so you put a lot of effort and, and think that damn something that isn't ready. So there are two sides to this. You can be too fast and too slow. So, but look ahead. <coughs> and that is a picture. Mm. I think we all know about this. Um, if an aircraft, that its angle of attack is greater than the force or something like that, but we don't get it. This, 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 jet, this jet is about to do, and if it's near the ground, that's it. That'll, that'll be that. Identify in your own business some leading indicators that will tell you that this is going to happen. because. It will be exactly like a plane. Its nose will drop, and you will have time to catch it if you're too near the ground. So watch that. Know what your leading indicators are. <coughs> really do, and don't ignore them. Particularly if you've got quite a lot of fast growth because you can overtrade, and I think that's a point that I'm making. And there's all sorts of kinds of stalling. There's financial stalling, and there's cultural stalling, and there's product stalling. Just, just please, if there's nothing else, take that picture home in your head and have a think about it. <coughs> Stay attractive. Um, <laughs> to employees. Because, and I just cannot say this enough, uh, it speaks for itself, this slide. If you just read it, it is so true. Um, and I say this because our corporate owners, I had a company that people knew was world class and they believed desperately in the vision we had and that it was something so much bigger. Lose that, and that's a cultural, that's a hearts and minds store, then you, you know, that's what you are really. Anybody's business is a bit like that. So just be so careful. 
and make sure that that, I call it um, sprinkling sparkle. I talk about sprinkle sparkle. And the idea I have in my head is if you watch Master Chef, you know when they go and chef this, chef that, that sort of thing. And the chef stands there, and this is your role as a leader. And you know, all the sous chef do and the plates come out, and he just goes, no, no, he just goes, okay, you know, service, that kind of stuff. That, I think, is a really good analogy of what you should be doing sort of culturally. Uh, sprinkling sparkle, another one perhaps. <coughs> so, um, that's it. Um, I'm Harry Clark. That was my shot of going broke. I'd be delighted for your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much.